In the first episode on this series on cooling, we were talking about this thermosiphon system where coolant was allowed to flow freely through the system and anything that would heat up here would rise here and the movement would keep it going through the radiator where it would be cooled, the cooled stuff would drop down, further moving this coolant around, and then the cycle would just keep continuing. But the problem here is we don't have any control over the temperature here. If the air is really hot coming through here, then it's not gonna cool as effectively. And if it's winter outside snowing and it's super cold coming through here, you might end up overcooling your engine. So let's talk about that second condition I mentioned, overcooling. How bad could it be to cool the engine down more than the typical engine gets cooled down? Let's start with achieving maximum performance out of your engine. In the combustion chamber here, there's an ideal temperature roughly where you wanna be in order for combustion to occur in its optimal way. When this engine is running, your air fuel mixture is gonna come into the combustion chamber, and if your cylinder walls are too cold, then the fuel is gonna to wanna to hang out over there, condense, and turn back into a liquid. So your cylinder walls here have coolant passing by on the inside. When gasoline is burning, what's actually happening is the vapor itself is burning, and you want to have atomized fuel for that vapor to be at the ready at any given moment. And if it's condensing on the walls, then it's turning back into a liquid, and if it's really cool, then it's not even evaporating off. So you're gonna end up with liquid fuel on your cylinder walls that's not gonna burn off when combustion occurs. Not only is that gonna throw off your air-fuel ratio, but as the piston comes up, some of that fuel is going to get past the piston rings and hang out with the oil that's on there. It's supposed to be lubricating your cylinder walls, and it's gonna dilute that. The oil's not gonna lubricate as properly, and you'll end up with more wear. That fuel is gonna to continue to drip down into your crankcase where it further dilutes your oil. The oil in your crankcase can normally cook out impurities like water or even sometimes fuel before it chemically combines, but because you're overcooling this engine, it doesn't get up to temperature and it's never able to do that. So even if you have amazing piston rings that somehow manage to keep the fuel at the top of your piston, you still have water that can occasionally get into your oil that never cooks out. Motor oil that gets used but never gets up to operating temperature can sometimes build up as sludge as well. That sludge can build up pretty much anywhere oil shows up and it can prevent oil from getting to the parts that need it. That will cause accelerated wear on those parts and eventually it'll destroy your engine. So, overcooling your engine, definitely a bad idea. But how do we control the temperature of the engine knowing this? While there are two ways that are typically used to regulate engine temperature nowadays, there are four main ways that we're gonna go over today. So in the previous video, we talked about how cool air comes in, goes past the fins on the radiator, and then comes out the other side with the heat, and it takes that heat away. Well, one of the ways that we can control the temperature is by blocking off the radiator a bit. So here's a shield, and just up top here is where the air is flowing through. So none of this here is currently flowing through anymore. So as I drew this, we currently have about half the size of the radiator that we did before. Air is still going to flow through, but it's not going to be as effective. The hot coolant is still coming up here, and then as it goes down here, it's still getting cooled down, so there is still some force moving it this way, but by the time it gets here, there's no more additional cooling that's happening, so it just moves on here, and it's a little warmer than it was before. But this looks permanent. I haven't drawn any moving parts on it yet. Well, we can fix that by putting a pivot point on here. This is just a hypothetical design. Some of them would be at the top, some of them would be at the bottom. Some of them would be fixed. You'd install it on a winter day and just make sure that the air isn't overcooling your radiator. And then you take it off if the temperature outside is a little warmer. This is on like a really old school car, but that's the way that it was done. So we'd have this pivot point and there's a cable that goes from here around these wheels to the driver. Then the driver has something that they can pull on the dashboard and when they pull it out, the cable goes this way and then, now this panel's out of the way, the air can flow through the entire radiator and cool more effectively. If the driver needs to control that, they can just use the dashboard lever to open and close it. There were cars back in the day that had flaps like this, but the way I designed it is probably fictional. The flap could have also been on the other side of the radiator where it opens up this way, because even if you close this side, air can't actually flow through this direction, so even though this is exposed, air's not flowing through it and cooling it. Now that design that I just showed you was the primary means of control on some cars, or secondary on others, but 
on modern cars, they are making a comeback as a third option to control temperatures. On modern cars where they're trying to get the most fuel efficiency as possible out of them, if you don't need a whole bunch of air coming through your radiator, and you can block off a small portion and have the air flow around the body instead, that's more designed for aerodynamics, that is gonna be a benefit, and some manufacturers are doing that. However, that is another electronic part that they have to install on the car to do a function that the car's already kind of doing, so it's an added expense that not a lot of manufacturers are doing. So let's get into the second of these four designs. Like the first one, this is an old school design that is just gonna regulate airflow, and instead of with the previous one where we blocked inlet air coming in, this design is going to block outlet air coming out. So if you have a body design that has louvers on the hood or on the sides that let engine bay air out, then if you close those up, the air flowing through here can't move out as readily. So the heat kind of stays put here. And some of the air that wants to come in is going to divert out and around from the radiator around the body instead of going through. This kind of design typically appeared on early model cars that had the engine bay area enclosed in its own unit and the fenders were their own entities. These louvers were used to control how much air was allowed to escape and was typically manually controlled by the driver. So now on to our third method putting exhaust back into the engine via the intake. So normally when the engine is running, it's drawing in air from the outside and that air is about 21% oxygen. If you happen to know the exact number, let me know in the comments below. Anyway, that air comes in and the fuel is mixed with it at some point in the process. Direct injection is right there in the combustion chamber, but it started out in a carburetor and has moved closer and closer to the combustion chamber since. That's a topic for another video, but ideally what happens is there's a certain amount of oxygen coming in and the right amount of fuel gets mixed with that so that combustion occurs pretty much perfectly. There's other things going on, but we'll get to that in that other video. Combustion occurs and then O2 gets broken up and combined with other chemicals, so technically the atomic oxygen is there, but the O2 that you wanna burn is no longer there. There might be trace amounts, but definitely not 21%. So there's pretty much no oxygen coming out of the exhaust, so why would you wanna mix that in with your intake air? So what started us on this whole cooling journey is that combustion occurs and generates heat. The bigger the combustion, the more heat is generated. So if you take some of those combustion gases that are coming out of the engine and reroute them back into the intake, then it actually reduces the amount of oxygen that's in that combined amount of air. In a fuel injection system, they'd inject less fuel. In a carbureted system, because the air coming in is reducing the vacuum a little bit, pulling less fuel through, you end up with about the right amount of fuel for the air too. But summing all that up, the amount of oxygen coming in is reduced, the amount of fuel coming in is reduced, there's less oxygen and fuel to burn, so reduced combustion, reduced heat. When you do it that way, you also get the added benefit of using less fuel so your miles per gallon goes up. That's awesome. There are other drawbacks that you have to take into consideration too, though. We'll talk about that a little more in depth when I do an exhaust gas recirculation valve video. But yes, the third way to regulate engine temperatures is to take hot exhaust gas, feed it back into the engine, and cause combustion to be weaker, and therefore the engine is cooler. So the fourth method is the most well-known of the four, a thermostat. This is a temperature regulating device that is embedded in the cooling system itself. In this drawing, this thermostat would end up right about here on the engine. Let's erase some of this so I can draw a bigger thermostat. So here's our actual thermostat down here and a big version that I drew here so it's easier to see. And I don't have a cutaway of this, so I did a cutaway of this one. This is the wax pellet that's on the inside. That's the only thing I've shown on the inside. What happens here is this blue part is just a gasket. It wraps around the metal part and seals your water outlet from the block or whatever else the water outlet is attached to. Sometimes it's not a water outlet, but the idea is that two components come together, squeezing on this gasket, sealing one side of the thermostat up from the other side, and there is a little tiny hole that will be in the thermostat most of the time that lets a little bit of coolant through, and a lot of times that's for burping the system when you would get in the air out of the system. So your coolant is here, and heat is rising up to here where the thermostat is, and it's reaching this brass area here. The brass area is in yellow. You might be able to see the brass here. Inside that brass is a wax pellet, and that wax is designed to expand at a certain rate and at a certain temperature to where when it reaches that temperature, it expands. When that wax expands, it has nowhere to go except to push this down, and this is attached to this red component here, and as soon as this red component comes down, 
coolant can bypass through this thermostat and keep heading this way through the radiator and it keeps going until this coolant gets too cold, this wax shrinks back down and because it's shrinking back down, that combined with this spring that pushes that red back into place, that seals it back up and the temperature regulates at whatever this is designed to regulate at and it continues to open and close as needed. These thermostats are wear items and can fail in multiple ways. The least extreme of which is it becomes sluggish and that means it will open and close at a reduced speed and you may get your needle moving around a little bit more than you think that it should. Your temperature gauge may go up and down a little higher and or lower than you expect and it may move around a lot more than it did before but it's better than failing in a closed or open position. If it fails in a closed position, you've effectively cut off all your coolant flow and you're gonna overheat real quick. If it fails in the open position, that means you're gonna be overcooling your system and we've already gone over why that's a bad thing. If you go to replace a thermostat, sometimes if you go to the parts store, you can actually buy a thermostat that opens at a different temperature. If you're buying a thermostat for your car that's driven on public roads, even if it's been modified and you're making mad power with that cold air intake, just stick with the OEM temperature, you'll be fine. Engines that are making way more power than stock and are being driven full throttle way more often than not are gonna be in more extreme conditions than the normal road car is. So a thermostat is gonna to have to be altered a bit to get it to the temperature that it needs to be at. The learning isn't over yet. Before you move on to my next video, if you have any questions or comments about what you saw in this video today, use the comment section below. Thanks for watching, consider subscribing, and I'll see you in the next Car Simplified video.